we've all said things like, just wait until my ship comes in, or one of these days my promise will come, or I'll make it one of these days. But what do you do when your ship does come in? What do you do when the promise does come? How do you make it when you make it? How do you succeed in your success? It's time to speak about that. All right, we are back again in episode two. I cannot be more excited about it. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a crooked shelf over here that Pastor had pointed out, and now I just felt the need to point it out to you. We'll get now it fixed. Now everybody knows we're about just, it. We're gonna get, we know that there's going to be complaints about it. We know that people are upset about it. Well, it's like the little clipping I keep in my Bible. I cut it out of the newspaper years ago. Mm-hmm. It says, in this publication, there are mistakes. But please remember, we try to print something for everyone, mm-hmm. and some people are always looking for mistakes. That's right. So if you are looking for mistakes there it is. and you're on YouTube, you know, the shelf doesn't bother you if you're in podcast, but if you're on YouTube, there's the shelf. You're allowed to look at it. We'll get it fixed. Um, and maybe we won't because there's got to be th- something for everybody, I suppose. Well, that's right. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll just get right into this. Um, we were talking yesterday or the day before um, one of these, you know, past days, um, about how a lot of conversations are based on the subject of working towards your goals or waiting on your purpose um, or uh, building until, you know, quote unquote, that day comes, right. if, whether that be the will of God in your life or it's just something that you've, you know, worked towards yeah. um, in, in your job or um, anything in, in your life. And I think that sometimes the focus is put on the process there and, um, and maybe not all the time, but I know that for me personally, I think that I, you know, would focus on that kind mm-hmm. of more than when the day does actually come, you know. Uh, and so today we're focusing more on when you get there, making right. it when you reach the call of God in your life, making it when you finally get that position um, that you've worked so hard for. And uh, I guess to start this off, it's, you know, more of a simple question, but why is this so important to talk about? Why is it important to speak on, you know, how to make it when you make it or how to succeed in your success? Well, I I think that first of all, there's an old Arab proverb that says, when your purpose is realized, then begins its decay. And um, we all love a good success story, we're inspired by it. We're motivated by it. We, we spend money to buy biographies of successful people and read how they leadership books and read how they made it and how they were so successful. But on the other side of that, there's also nothing that can stifle or stunt or stymie our growth like success. So, um, it it is, uh, I think, I won't go so far as to say a fact, but it, it's an observation, I'll say it that way, that uh, more lives are ruined by success than they are by failure. Wow. Um, the reason for that is there's such a determination in the human psyche, our minds, that when we fail, we often are more encouraged to try harder the next time. You know the old saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, Mm -hmm. has been drilled into us. But then on on the other hand, nobody's ever really drilled into us what to do when we succeed. Mm -hmm. So consequently, when people succeed, they kind of stop trying again. And thus they become somewhat stifled in their success. So I think it's important to talk about it because um, out of success, there comes a complacency, a satisfaction with where you are and, and what you've accomplished. And we want to kind of pull back and just sit back and, and rest on our achievements or uh, our laurels, so to speak. And, and we kind of, when we do that, 
it dulls our mind. It, it sort of curbs our will and erodes our will. And sometimes success can actually, I think, cut that nerve in us that gives us that drive for continued effort to achieve more. Right. So it's like we got to the top of the ladder and now we're just spending all of our time at the top of the ladder looking around and looking down. And I think no matter how much you achieve in life, it's a whole lot better if you're constantly trying to do just a little bit more to improve on the success that you've had. Right. Um, and I think it's important to talk about it because many, many people in life become parked by their success. Mm -hmm. Well, I've read too, just in, you know, preparing for this conversation, um, a thing called successful depression. Mm -hmm. And so you have people who, uh, you know, were steady on the grind. They were just dedicated to, to achieving this goal in their life, um, whether it be a business that they've started or just something in their personal life that they decided to achieve. And then they get to that point and then they feel like they've plateaued. Right. And, and so, and then I read a story, uh, I thought kind of fit well Um, this guy was in Texas. He caught an 11 pound bass. Mm -hmm. He was just. He, he fished and fished and fished and fished and fished. Finally caught his his dream, you know, yeah. trophy fish. He mounts it, puts it on the wall, and uh, a man comes to interview him about this fish, and they're just sitting there talking. And uh, and he said, how do you feel after you've, you've caught this dream catch? And he said, well, it's kind of ruined fishing for me. Mm -hmm. and, and the guy said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, he's like, you know, you just put so much effort into finding the fish and then you find it and you catch it and now it's on the wall and you think, what's there to do? He right. said, now I guess I'll go over the five pound crappie. Yeah. And so you always, I feel you have to find something new, find something right. different, but that is, you know, somewhat the same. And how do you do that? How do you get to a point in, in this is what I'd like for you to speak on. How do you get to a point after you've made it to where you don't plateau, but you continue to build. And what do you build? And and how do you how mm -hmm. do you proceed in that? Well, you, you know, I'm I'm reminded it was probably after his fourth Super Bowl win that Tom Brady was interviewed, and I'll never forget what he said after that at that interview when they asked him how it felt to win that many Super Bowls. And he just had this blank stare on his face, and he said, like, there has to be something more. There has to be something more than this, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why Tom Brady has had such a hard time actually retiring because and, – and he went on to win a few more Super Bowls – because in him was the drive to continue to build on that success. And I, I think that what happens to people is that they look at their list of accomplishments and they say it's enough. And then they just stop. And obviously, there's going to come a point in all of our lives when we retire and we step away from those positions or we graduate from high school or college and we've accomplished that goal but the problem is that once we reach that plateau we still have to continue growing mm -hmm. and so I think what happens is that that people fail to grow they fail to develop they fail to mature and they fail to move onward and upward um, and and really they fail to explore their fullest potential. So in other words, if I've done this much, how can I make this better? How can I, how can I grow personally so that I have fresh ideas and, and um, more insight? How can I become more creative now that I'm here? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I have found over the years that when I, was a, when I was a younger man, I'm still young, I'm not old, but when I was a younger man and um, aspiring to position things in the ministry, not necessarily positions because I never sought a position. Uh, I always told the Lord that if it came my way, I would be available. Uh, obviously, I desired to be a part of some things, and so God's blessed me 
to be uh, in leadership in various departments and things um, throughout the years. But the thing that always sort of um, intrigued me was how that when I was elected to that position, I didn't feel any different. And I thought I would. I, I thought that, you know, all of a sudden this great um, cloud of anointing or um, success or, you know, sense of, of achievement was going to just settle over me. And, and really it was like I woke up the next day and I'm like, I still kind of feel the way I felt two days ago, you know. And so I couldn't, but I couldn't just stay there and say, okay, well, now I have this title and I'm just going to enjoy the position. I had to find ways to continually challenge myself to grow and to become more creative in that position. So to avoid plateauing, I think you've got to just continue to, to be insightful, to listen to other people, listen to people that are coming up beneath you that are part of your team that, that have ideas and don't just think that, that, you know, you're the only one that can do the job. Um, you have the title, but you also have the responsibility. Right. And, you know, ultimately it, it rests on you. But, but when you reach that plateau, just don't stop growing and don't, don't just die on the vine, as it were. Right. Well, I've, I've read where young men build in their early, you know, lives. Mm -hmm. They build themselves. Right. Only to get to the place that they are building themselves to. Mm -hmm. And they realize that now they build their lives for others and mm -hmm. they're building others. And yeah. I've read that in a, you know, uh, in a pastoral, mm -hmm. you know, way too. I've, True. I've seen where, or I've read where in one of his sermons that mm -hmm. when he was a young man, he said, all I want to do is evangelize. All I want to do is evangelize. Yeah. And then he started evangelizing. He said, all I want to do is pastor. All I want to do is pastor. And then he started pastoring mm -hmm. and he said, what do I do now? Yeah. Because he never felt any different, like you said. Mm -hmm. And then, and then he was explaining through, I wish I could remember that who it was, but, um, then he expressed how he realized and this revelation came to him is that you've been building yourself this whole time mm -hmm. and now you're here and you have to build others. Yeah. And do you think that's part of it? Do you think that, you know, the focus kind of turns away from you and you sort of, you know, how has that been in your life? Is that, has that been, you know, applied in, in you or do you, do you agree with that? Do you not? How much at one point in time when you, when you get to where you're going, do you have to turn and say, okay, now I'm here. It's about the people around me, you know? Right. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's like when you were a kid and you were waiting for Christmas, you, you know, and all you could think about was just tearing into the box and hopefully it was the football you'd asked for or the, the game that you'd asked for. And then you, you tear into the box and you get it. And then it's like, boom, you just move on to the next thing. You know, we put it all aside and, play with it for a few hours and then it just becomes ordinary it's just every day I, I think keeping a fresh sense of of the excitement of the initial achievement in your life uh, goes a long way to helping you uh, stay motivated moving forward and realizing that you know the prize would have the, the gift would have never been there without somebody else so you know I'm there's somebody said it like this. They said, you know, there's no such thing as a self-made man. And no matter how much we work on ourselves, we still have other people to be grateful for. You know, and you're talking about the young man just saying, I want to, I want to go here. I want to do this. I want to evangelize. I want to pastor. You know, I wonder really if he just failed to enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know what I mean? It's like I used to look forward to going on trips, and I think, man, I can't wait for the day to get here that we get to go on vacation or go on this excursion or go hunting or go fishing or whatever. And then it gets here, and it's gone just like that. And I realized that I wasted a lot of time building up to that moment not and not enjoying the days up to the trip because the trip goes by fast. Unfortunately, in life, most of our ultimate success, whatever we're ultimately going to become, is probably going to pass by pretty quick. 
you know, that initial feeling of becoming the evangelist or becoming the pastor, it fades pretty fast. But the success is still there. So slow. if you learn to slow down before you get to it, it helps you to slow down after you get there. Wow. And then, you, you know, you, you can pull people in with you because you're not in such a hurry to move on to the next accomplishment. You know, okay, so now I've evangelized. Now I've done all these things. I've filled all these positions. I've been involved in all these ministries. And now I'm pastoring. And now I'm working. And I'm, I'm, now I'm looking forward to retirement. You know, well, then retirement's going to get here. And you're going to look back and say, I wish I'd have spent a little more time enjoying that. So, yeah, I think if you'll, if you'll spend time with people, once you get to that place of leadership or, you know, maybe you're not in necessarily place of leadership, but you, you've you reached the career goal that you wanted. And if you'll just stop and smell the roses and value the people around you, then it, it just makes your success that much more enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're if, if you're really successful climbing the ladder, you're going to be pulling people up behind you. So I'm no leadership expert by any stretch of the imagination, but it just seems to me that if I'm not developing the next generation, then they're not going to know how to develop the next generation and so on and so forth. And ultimately, nobody succeeds. Right. So, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in that. You know, years ago, I was, uh, I was kind of bemoaning the fact that a lot of things hadn't happened yet. And um, I was driving down the road, just sort of feeling sorry for myself. And um, the Lord just kind of slapped me upside the head, so to speak. And I, I, I won't say I heard the audible voice of God, but me and God had a conversation. It was mostly him talking, me mm-hmm. listening, you know, me saying, yes, sir, I'm sorry, I apologize, mm-hmm. I repent. But it was, um, you know, I, I was kind of bemoaning the fact that, you know, I was in my 30s and things hadn't really I hadn't got to the place I thought I should have been. And um, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, haven't I done everything up to this point that you have dreamed of or hoped for or that I said I would do? And I, I said, well, yes, God, you have. And he said, well, what makes you think I won't finish the rest of it? And I mean, you know, we talk about arguing with God, but the truth of the matter is when he speaks, you, you, you just listen, you know, and, and you don't really have much of an argument. I didn't have a leg to stand on, so I just said, well, God, you're you're absolutely right, and I repent. I'm sorry. And it helped me to recognize that if, he done, if he's done all A, B, C, D, he's going to do E, F, G, and he's going to finish what it is right when the Scripture says he will perfect that which concerns me he will and it helps you just to enjoy where you are you know because how many kids have thrown a fit in the floor and tantrums and for something they wanted their parents had already gotten it for them and but they didn't get it fast enough and then when the parent handed it to them the kid just sulks off they're mad, and they it takes all the joy of uh, of attainment away from you, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I just decided that after that conversation, that you know what, I'm just going to slow down and be thankful for where I am right now, and and learn what I need to learn now, so that when I reach that place of attainment, I don't have to I don't have to be embarrassed about my behavior, right. and I've learned how to handle that, that level of success because I, because I paid attention in the middle part. And I'm going to tell you something. We are going to be accountable to God for the gap that exists between, between our potential and what we actually do. Wow. Um, and, and if I can say it this way, when Jesus told the parable of of the master who gave you know what ten talents and and five and two or whatever one one talent, um, the man that buried his talent he was accountable to the master because he didn't try at all because he was afraid. 
So that gap that existed between what the master believed he was capable of handling and doing and what he actually did, he had to give account for it. And what he failed to do caused him to lose what he did have and robbed him of any future potential that he may have developed somewhere along the way. And what, what was taken from him was given to somebody else. So, you know, God's merciful. He's long-suffering. He's patient. But I don't think he puts up with us forever. He, you know, he just there comes a point where he says, okay, you, you, you could accomplish this, but because you're not paying attention in these small things, uh, I can't, I can't hand you all that. Right. So, yeah. Well, and it's, you know, I don't think that, I think there's a big difference. Let me say it like this between achieving or receiving, you know, the two and you're reaching for 10 then for missing out on the 10 because you were just done it too. Oh yeah. No. Well, I mean, look, the sooner, you know, here's the problem we run into is we want to compare ourselves to everybody else. And the scripture obviously warns us against doing that because we're always going in our own eyes to fall short of someone else's accomplishments or their recognition or their abilities. We're always going to see ourselves in one of two ways. Either we're going to see ourselves as less than them or we're going to see ourselves as better than them. And both of those estimations are inaccurate. They're wrong. The truth is we aren't supposed to be everything that that person is. You can glean from somebody, emulate somebody else's life, even a certain amount of imitation in the sense that you put certain practices into effect in your life um, is fine. But at the end of the day, we, we all develop the person that we're su- supposed to be, but we can't do that if we're constantly saying, well, I don't sing like her, or I don't preach like Kim, or I don't pastor as big a church as this guy does, or I'm not as smart as that guy in the class. Uh, I didn't graduate with honors. Um, somebody <laughs> said one time their daughter had graduated magna cum laude, and uh, the mom said, I'm just I'm just glad they graduated. Thank the Lottie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so many times for me personally, that's kind of how I feel. It's like the honors are great, but I just thank the Lord that I'm even involved. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, the scripture's clear. Some got a hundred fold, some 60 fold, some 40, you know, I'm not going to be judged on, what your level of anointing is. I'm going to be judged on what my level, my potential is. And so, um, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a 40 guy and I get to 50, great. But God's, God's looking at me to do what I can with what he gave me, not what he gave you. So we have a hard time with that because again, we're constantly looking at other people and, comparing ourselves to them and saying, well, you know, I mean, you know, we can all do better. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just a dangerous thing to start comparing yourself with everyone or, you know, others, or your peers especially yeah. around you. And, um, you know, uh, isn't that what the publican was doing when he was, when he was, uh, you know, beating his chest and saying, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And the Pharisee was standing there saying, Lord, I thank you I'm not like him, you know. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisee went home still stuck in his success and his sin, and the publican went home justified because he wasn't saying, I wish I could be more like that guy. He was just saying, this is me. Right. So, you know, God's looking at you for who you are. Right. And um, running into the comparison game is just a, I mean, it's a head-on collision with misery for sure. Right. So, oh, yeah. Well, it's like the woman who gave a little, but it was all that she had mm-hmm. you know, as compared to men who gave, you know, much, but it was nothing yeah. compared to what they had. Yeah. You know, I think that we have to be people that say, everybody else aside, I'm going to give what is my best. It may not be the best, but it will yeah. be my best. Right. You know, do you think that's why people fail when they succeed? Do you think that that's, you know, what causes failure whenever you make it to that place mm-hmm. is that? 
is that you stop trying to be that best because in your mind you've accomplished it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, it's, it's almost, um, it's almost like, you know, crossing the goal line and then calling the game when there's still a lot of game to be played, you know, because you scored a touchdown, there are still other points to get, you know. Like there are people all around us who could and they should be better off than they are. Mm-hmm. Um, they they should have reached higher. They could have reached higher um, than they actually have. Uh, a teacher that could teach better, a preacher that could preach better, a – a um, athlete who could perform at a higher level, a musician that that never has tapped into their their deepest resources and given the world the music that is inside of them. There, there's always some more. Uh, there's always more in us to do, you know. It, and it doesn't have to be leaps and bounds, but it's just a constant degree of improvement in our lives and. Um, you know, you, you wonder, There's there's got to be an artist somewhere. Like, where are the Michelangelos of our day? Where, where are the Picassos of our day? There's got to be an artist somewhere painting today who's saying, you know, this is pretty good. But how many unpainted masterpieces exist within, within the mind of artists who have just gotten at a certain level and, and said, okay, this is cool, I can just sort of enjoy the the celebrity that I have now. You know, um, if we all dig a little deeper, there's no telling how many treasures are still buried beneath the surface of our lives that I think, you know, it, it would, would enhance the world around us and would enhance our success. So, you know, I, I'm the pastor of a great church, and it, um, you know, I'm here. And what do I do? Do I just sit back and say, well, you know, the past 50 years have been great. And, you know, the past three years have been great. I think I'll just coast for the next 15 or 20 years until I retire and just enjoy it. Or am I going to challenge our church? Am I going to challenge our people to reach more and to become more than what we've ever been? Um, I'd rather do that Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, if I don't, I know it's just going to decline. That's why the old proverb is true that when your potential is realized, then begins its decay or decline. And it's because so many people just sit back and say, well, this is good enough. This is enough. But really, you know, the greatest task in life is to grow and to keep on growing. And if you ever stop growing, you're dying. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I just want to make sure that um, that I don't do what human nature often inclines us to do, and that is to park by what's good, what's fair, what's acceptable, and what's a little bit above average and reach for more. I'd rather make it to heaven, you know, with – with no gas in the tank, then get there with three quarters in the tank and realize that I only, you know, gave 25%. So how do you, I know you wanted to speak to this. And so I want to segue you into this. How do you not um, remain stagnant once you reach that success? How do you, you know, how do you continue? How do you stay from, how do you avoid the complacency? Maybe not even complacency, but just the, you know, being stagnant in your success. Well, somebody said it like this. They said, just when you get satisfied with what you've accomplished and what you've got and what you've done, that's when the concrete has begun to set in your mind. And, um, you, you know, so I think the way to avoid stagnation is to constantly be stirring your thoughts. The, the, the wheels don't need to cease turning. You know, whatever you have to do to keep your mind fresh, uh, to, to be open to new ideas and to new ways of doing things, 
you know, some people get to the point, I think, where they get entrenched in their in their traditions because they they they're so comfortable with them. And then those traditions become foundational truths in their life. And what happens is things move past those traditions. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, truth is truth, right? And what is right is right. It's always going to be right. But if it's just a matter of, you know, you're still stuck in the covered wagon mentality and we're traveling at superconductor speed, you know, that's stagnation. You, you need to be up here in, in the new mechanism that's moving us forward. You know, there's nothing wrong with, um, and I find the older I get, sometimes the, the more I bristle at new ideas or new things because I'm so used to it being the way it was at a certain point in my life. So I have to challenge myself and I have to say, you know, this is still the same. This is still the same. It's just we're doing it a different way. And, um, you know, so I think to avoid stagnation, you have to stay fresh. Oliver Wendell Holmes lived to be 94 years old, I believe. And um, he did many, many great things throughout his entire life, his 94 years, nearly a century of living. He wrote a book, and the book became a huge success, but he didn't stop there. Then he became a professor at Harvard, but he didn't stop there. Then he became appointed to the uh, Supreme Court, and uh, what an honor that is. I mean, only a handful of people ever get that privilege, but he didn't stop there. He became the chief justice of that court for um, 30 years, I think it was. And then when he retired at the age of 92, he started reading the works of Plato. And um, President Roosevelt asked him one day, he said, why are you reading Plato at 92? And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, to improve my mind. And that was his mindset, you know. Uh, my wife's grandmother, Mima Rumley, was 94 years old and still driving herself to a, um, uh, a gym twice or three times a week, two or three times a week. It was called Nifty After 50, and she's down there working out. We called her one day to tell her we were coming to see her, and she's like, oh, I'm at the gym working out. I'm 94, and she's still trying to improve her, and she lived to be uh, in her late 90s, you know. And what a, you know, what a wonderful example of somebody who just doesn't sit down. Stagnation is a killer. Stagnation will will stifle any hope of any future uh, blessing or, or, or success that you and I have. So you have to constantly just be moving forward and constantly, you know, keeping your mind active. You know, people that retire and then go sit on the couch all day, every day, watch TV and eat popcorn, don't live very long. But people that retire and travel or go here and go there, barring some major health issue in their life that prohibits that, those people live tend to live a lot longer. So, you know, it's constantly staying busy because you're in a state of maturing. And maturing isn't about age or it's not about uh, means of uh, what you have. Maturing is just really about getting to the point where, you know, you realize that I've got to keep growing and I'm determined to persevere. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what helps us avoid stagnation. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's so perfect and we didn't even try to do this, but the last, mm -hmm. the first episode that we ended on was mm -hmm. when you're trying to figure out who you are, Yeah. don't quit right? until you get to that place to where yeah. you finally are who you are. Mm -hmm. And this now, in this episode, we end on mm -hmm. when you make it, it's the same. Yeah, that there's right. this constant endeavor to continue. Right. There's this constant endeavor to to go to more and to reach higher and to not stay stagnant. Mm -hmm. And so no matter where you are, just keep on. Right. If you're getting there or if you've made it, just keep on. I could be wrong, so somebody may, you know, take issue with this, but I think it was Winston. The fact Church. checkers out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just take the point, okay? Yeah. Don't don't, don't if, fact I'm, check if I'm historically it's a good wrong, point. don't fact check a good point. Yeah, this just the moral of the story is this. 
so maybe I won't lay it to Churchill's charge, but I'm pretty certain it, w- it was fairly certain that it was him. I'm going to Google it right now. Yeah, and uh, Churchill was invited to give a speech at a graduation or some big event like that, and they waited and waited for him to come to the platform. And um, when he walked to the platform, he simply looked at that crowd of graduates and he said, never, 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 never give up. And then he turned around and sat down. Wow. So, you know, I, how true that is, I, you know, can't vouch for it, but take the moral of this, take the point and think about it. Never, 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 never give up. And that's how to make it when you make it. And that's how to succeed in your success. Amen. I could not add anything to that. Well, um, we want to end this today. Um, Pastor um, had this idea. Of course, you know that he is an avid reader, and uh, we thought it might be a a good idea for him to give some book suggestions kind of on the topics that we speak about. And so Mm -hmm. we may not do this every time, but as often as he wants to do it, Right. Um, you know, today we're talking about succeeding in your success. Mm-hmm. And so he has a couple of books here that he'll recommend to you just kind of on that topic. And oftentimes we'll end, um, on that. And so, uh, t- tell us about, okay. about the books. Yeah. Um, this book I picked up a long time ago and, uh, um, probably 2008, you know, and, um, So anyway, it was a gift to me somebody gave me. It's called The Fred Factor by Mark Sanborn. The Fred Factor by Mark Sanborn. Um, It it just really talks about how passion in your work and life can turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. And it tells the story of a man named Fred who was a mailman. And he just had a unique way of delivering the mail and making people on his route feel really uh, valued and uh, appreciated and it just it's a really good book it's not hard to read it's not a long read you know a few a few hundred pages maybe 150 or something but anyway that's a great book and then um, one of my favorite books of all time is called the proverbial Cracker Jack by Dale Henry uh, this is one of those books that you know people might just pass by but I mean, look at the cover. How can you how can you pass by that? It's kind of flashy. Mm-hmm. But he just talks about how to get out of the box and become the prize. And I'll just share a little clip with you. Dale Henry's a motivational speaker, Christian-based guy. And uh, he was scheduled to speak at a large convention in a huge hotel. And he was getting ready and realized that he had forgotten all of his ties. So he went down to the gift shop in this large hotel and... Um, he was uh, looking for a tie when um, someone came over to him, and I think it was a CEO of a company came over to him, and he tells the story how this person just assumed that he worked there and was asking him about some other item, whatever it was. And, and so Dale Henry just said, well, I don't know, but let's go over here and look. And he helped this person find what they needed. And turns out that, you know, this person was very important and had a lot of authority and uh, wound up inviting him when he found out. He's like, why did you come help me? And he said, because you asked. And he's like, but you're the speaker. He said, so I'm, you know, I'm a servant. So these are, these are great books, uh, The Fred Factor and The Proverbial Cracker Jack. Um, I'll give copies out to people, but I'll never give my two copies away. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you if you can find them and, and get them, read them, um, they'll they'll be a blessing to you, I believe. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, we'll even take it a step further. We'll put a link to where you can get them. We're not, you know, affiliated with them, but uh, we're not sponsored to say any of that. Just oh, an no. honest, honest book review. Yes. Um, and so, and if they want to pay get us, any you can reach jacks. us at. No. <laughs> Uh, no, but those are really good books. Yeah. Um, you gave me those books um, a while back, and I love them. I need to go back and read them mm-hmm. again for sure. Well, thank you all for joining us again, and uh, we hope that, you know, two episodes in, you're not tired of it. Maybe you'll come back for the third one and, uh, you know, for the episodes to come. But we are so excited about this, and we hope that you will join us next time on A Time to Speak podcast with Pastor Murray Ray. Mm-hmm.